Today's lesson is on inductive reasoning and conjecture. A conjecture is simply an educated guess. We make conjectures just about every day as we're making our decisions as we go through the day. As you walk through the math classroom, as you look around, you see everybody quickly studying and trying to figure out what they know, what they don't know. A good educated guess or conjecture is that that was a test day. When we use inductive reasoning, we're making a conjecture based on examples. So we're making an educated guess based on examples. A good example of this is a weatherman. Every day, they make an educated guess as to what the weather will be like that day and for the next few days. They are using their models, which use, helps them to make an educated guess about what they think is going to happen. They often could be wrong, however, they are using good sound conjectures to think about what is going to be our weather. Here we have an example. Make a conjecture about the next number of dots. Make sure to pause it for a moment before you make your, as you're making your conjecture. There are two ways to come up with a conjecture. In this example, we could use it geometrically. How that is done is we actually just look at the shapes and figure out what we think is going to come next. Here there's one, a pile of one dot, or I shouldn't say a pile, just one dot. Next, we add a dot to the bottom and add one above it. Next, we add a row in the bottom and move the other ones up. And we add another row at the bottom and move, move the other ones up. So using our conjecture, we would think that we would have one, two, three, four, five green dots on the bottom, and then we would have four, three, two, and one above it. We, al we could also do this problem algebraically. That is more like mathematically. We have one, then we have three, then we have six, so on and so forth. So we see we're growing by two, then we're growing by three, then we're growing by four. So when we say we're doing it algebraically, we look at the patterns of what's happening. We gain two, we gain three, we gain four. So our conjecture would be we're going to gain five for the next one, which would put us at 15. And that is actually the correct next term or next picture. Make a conjecture what you, are th you think is going to be the next fraction. If you said 1 36th, you would be correct. In this case, the top of the fraction is staying 1 every time. The bottom of the fraction is our first six numbers squared. So we have 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared, 4 squared, 5 squared, and finally 6 squared for our last term that we just added. Here are some pictures. On the left, we have a bunch of mathematical symbols. In the middle, it looks like we have a wrapper. And on the right-hand side, we see a stage. Do you have a good guess about what could come next? Well, if you think back a few years ago, there was a performance by the math department at the high school. We did our performance of Pi Diddy. If you really want to know what it was like, feel free to look it up on YouTube. But there we are after our performance. Now, we have an example. It says for points L, M, and N, L, M is 20, M, N is 6, and L, N is 14. Make a conjecture and draw a figure to, L to illustrate your conjecture. You might actually need to draw your figure first before you can make your conjecture. Make sure to pause the video as you are doing this. There are two ways that typically students try and complete this. One of them actually is incorrect, so let's see if you did the correct one or the incorrect one. 
We'll start with the one that sometimes people choose to do, which is actually a mistake. They will draw LM, which is 20. Then they will draw MN, which is 6. And lastly, they'll draw in the line segment that connects L to N, which is 14. Now, although this is a correct picture as far as having all the elements on there, we have a glaring mistake. That is, from L to M is 20. So that's like me walking to the back of the room is 20 feet. Then they also have L to N be 14 and N to M be 6. Now, if we go back to my example, if from me to the back of the room is 20 feet, then how could it be from me to the bulletin board be 14 feet and then to me to the back of the room to that same spot is 6 feet? Remember, you've always been told the shortest distance between two objects is a straight line. So that would be our 20 feet. Now, how could it also be 20 feet if we didn't go straight to the back wall? We went 14 and then 6. This is the example that does not work. What your picture should have looked like, actually, is a line segment. L on one end, M on the other end, and N in the middle. If you think back to last chapter, we learned something about betweenness. So N is between L and M. So our distance from L to M is 20. Our distance from L to N is 6, and from N to M is 14. This would be a much more accurate picture than the last one. Counterexample. A counterexample is simply an example that proves a statement false. Let's go back to our weather example. The weatherman said that today there's a 70% chance of rain. That would make us think that, well, we better bring an umbrella or maybe our rain jacket today because we might get wet. We get up, we go to school, we come back home, and we go to bed. During the day, there was no rain. Our counterexample would be that there is no rain today. We could have another example be, today we're going to have a test. You show up in class, and Mr. Schrader does not give a test. That would be a counterexample because we were told there was a test today, however, you were not given one. So a counterexample is an example that proves a statement false. Here's a picture as an example, or a chart as an example. It says, based on the table showing unemployment rates for various cities in Kansas, find a counterexample for the following statement. The unemployment rate is highest in cities with the most people. As we look at our chart, we see that there are 90,000 people in Shawnee. Their unemployment rate is the third highest. That seems to hold true that the unemployment rate is highest in cities with a lot of people. Our second largest city is Douglas, or excuse me, county is Douglas County. That happens to also be our second highest for unemployment rate. But if we look further, Osagi, which has 10,000 people, which is actually kind of in the lower group of the population, they actually have the highest unemployment rate. We could use Osagi as a counterexample to the statement that says unemployment rates for four cities in Kansas are higher with the most people, when you have the most people. Well, Osagi does not have the most people, and it actually has the highest unemployment rate. It, therefore, is a counterexample to the statement. Here's a mathematical example. Is Mr. Rood's conjecture true or false? If it is false, prove it is false with a counterexample. So we are given m plus y is greater than 10. We also know that y is greater than 4, or equal to 4. Our conjecture here is that m must be less than or equal to 6. 
Take a moment and see if you can come up with a counterexample. Okay, let's start out checking this out. It says, we have two letters, M and Y, that when added together are greater than 10. But whatever Y we choose, it has to be greater than 4. I'm going to choose Y, let's try that again, Y equal to 6. Well, is that greater than or equal to 4? Sure is. Now, what number could we add to y to make it greater than 10? Well, I'm going to choose 3. What's 6 plus 3? Hmm. It's 9, isn't it? I don't have a good example here. I can't use a counterexample in which my information is not correct because it says M and Y when added together have to be greater than 10. Well, the numbers I chose are not greater than 10. So that can't work. I have to first obey the original statement before I can come up with my counterexample. So I'm going to choose a little bit larger Y. I'm going to choose a y of 8. And I'm going to choose an m, let's say, of 5. Let's recheck us, check this now. y is greater than 4, because it's 8. That part holds out. y plus m is 13, so that is greater than 10. So, is this a counterexample? Well, the conjecture is that m has to be smaller than or equal to 6. 5 is smaller than or equal to 6. What we've actually done here is partially prove that what his statement says is true. Let's try this one more time. A nice way to try and prove something false is to choose either the smallest or largest value. I'm going to choose y is greater than or equal to 4. Well, the smallest value I could choose there is y equals 4. Now we have to go back and figure out what can I add to y to make 10. Well, if I have m equal to 6, I do have something that's greater than or equal to 10. Now if we check out, is m less than or equal to 6? And it is. So this conjecture is actually true. We have no way to prove it false. Our final example says, is Mr. Root's conjecture true or false? If it is false, prove it false with a counterexample. So given three point, four points, w, x, y, and z, the conjecture is, W, X, Y, and Z are non-collinear. We have point W, point X, point Y, and point Z. As I drew them, they're all on a line. Guess what? That proves it true. Did you catch the mistake? No. It says the conjecture is W, X, Y, and Z are non-collinear. Are these points non-collinear? They are not. So I've actually proved that his conjecture is false because his conjecture is saying that four points are non-collinear. I just drew my four points, and they're not non-collinear. They're actually on a line. That is it for today. Make sure to bring any of your questions back to class and ask me about them tomorrow.